Hello, and good to see you again, even though you are just the eye of a tiny camera on top of my monitor. Welcome to Five Year Club video number 204, where we will be reading a paper fortune torn to shreds from the Japanese family storehouse, a 333-year-old uh, Japanese um, book uh, written during the feudal times in Japan. Uh, you know, primarily stories about wise money management, and I don't agree with everything in this book, but... It is very amusing to uh, to see this perspective, and uh, there's some weird stuff in here. That's why we keep going. So, story we're gonna get underway right now. A paper fortune torn to shreds. Under Chisuke's management, the family drapery business had gone steadily downhill. Formerly, the firm of Hishia, readily distinguished by the bold diamond crest on its shop lines had stood in Hancho in the town of Fuchi alongside the foremost drapers of Suruga province and had not only competed successfully for local custom, but had dispatched numbers of its clerks to the eastern and northern provinces where they had established thriving branch shops. The staff increased yearly, and the domestic catering grew to such proportions that smoke as dense as the clouds above Fuji in eruption rose ceaselessly from the great kitchen range, and Lake Biwa would have been needed to fill the water buckets. There were more red lacquered bowls than there are fallen maple leaves at Tatsuta, and the rows of gleaming white chopsticks looked like frost pillars covering Musashi Plain. Frost pillars are erected in the morning and melted by nightfall. And when the house of Hishia melted away, it may have seemed that this, too, was no more than the way of the world and the end of an appointed season. But the true cause lay elsewhere, in the master's carelessness. Drama. Chisuke's father had started life with very little. But it was he who had discovered the method of creping a Bagawa paper kimono, and coloring them with a variety of fine stencil patterns, and when his products had become established as the specialty of this district, he sold them to merchants from all over Japan. At first he had no rivals in his field, and it is rumored that in a little over thirty years he had made one thousand kanmei. His son, Chisuke, was blessed with no such ability, and for more than ten years after he inherited the business bookkeeping and common sense alike, were, and after he inherited the business, bookkeeping and common sense alike were in abeyance. The beads on his abacus hung as motionless as dewdrops on a branch of willow, except when rudely shaken by the vernal gales which blow on reckoning day. Like ice beneath the sun's rays, to such poverty did he fall, in a decline for which few parallels exist. His fortune melted to water. Had he even thought to warm the water for a drink, he would have found his firewood locker empty. If making money is a slow process, losing it is quickly done. Now that Chisuke had run through his whole fortune, he realized the truth of this, but the knowledge was acquired too late. He was obliged to move to the outskirts of town, to a house in front of the Singen Shrine, and there, in hired rooms, he prepared to eke out the remainder of his fleeting life. People's sympathy had lasted only as long as his prosperity. Even his relatives and friends kept their distance now, and he could hardly complain if the rest of the world ignored him. The clerks who had helped to bring their master to these straits set up in business on their own under a different name and abandoned him to his own devices without so much as a letter of condolence. He received no skewered mackerel at Bonn, and no mirror cakes at New Year's. One day was as wretched as another, and even in the last moon when everyone else was so busy he had nothing to do. Towards the end of one year his neighbors had gathered together and were playing at guessing each other's ages. You have the appearance of a fairly young man, they said, when it came to Chisuke's turn, and yet there is something old in your expression, and of course you have grown up children. It's a rough guess, 
but we should not be far out if we put you at 48 or 49. Gentlemen, you are making a big mistake, said Chisuke, apparently taking offense. At the moment, I am 39. No one could understand this. Come, you can hardly expect us to believe that you are 39 or even 40. Tell us your real age, please. The number of years I have lived is 47, he admitted, in answer to persistent questions. But, all the same, my age is 39. How can that be? On New Year's Day, he said, I celebrated the occasion with no zony straws, nor even a clean suit of clothes. Nothing is further from my thoughts than pine decorations. I haven't even an almanac to look at to tell me the lucky quarter has shifted east or the plums are in blossom in the south. And as the years in which I have thus failed to pass into the next now number eight, although I am 47, I am 39. They were still laughing over this when Chisuke remarked with evident confidence that one day, when he had enough money to cover a journey to Nisaka in Totomo, Totomi province, he would go there and become a rich man in no time. His companions promptly made a collection and presented him with a string of 1,200 zenny, which was no small mark of kindness from the people living in such straitened circumstances. Delighted, Chisuke rose from his place and without further delay, he rose from his place without further delay and set off on the journey. He must have rich relations there, they thought, and is going to tell them of his troubles. Or perhaps he plans to demand payment from some old credit sales. But wherever he goes, at least he should get enough to pay for a real new year. Full of curiosity, they waited for his return. But Shisuke's plan was very different from anything they had imagined. Crossing the river Oi, with its ever-shifting channels, he went on a pilgrimage to the Temple of Kanon, which stands on a peak above the pass of Sayo no Nakayama. The afterlife, however, could take care of itself. He had come to pray for better luck in this one. Asking where it was that long ago they had buried the wishing bell of Mukin, he stood over the spot and spoke his wish. In my own lifetime, just once, make me a millionaire. If my children in their day become beggars, it is no matter. Help me now, that is all I ask. And the rich merchant and Shisuke's daughter. What? So that is apparently the, man, that, that focus is really bad. I need to get a different camera if I'm going to show things like this. So yeah, there's a graphic, and I guess I will be uh, taking a picture of that one too. So passionately did he pray, and so violent did, violently did he strike the ground above the bell, that the reverberations must have penetrated to hell itself. Nowadays, even the prospect of becoming a snake in the, next, in the next existence is no deterrent to money lovers, and how much less, if striking this bell could really bring riches, could they be halted by paltry threats of leech hells. Foolish Chisuke, by coming here, spent his traveling money to no purpose. On this occasion, he had luckily not much to lose. On returning to Suruga, he explained what he had done, and everyone who heard the story laughed at him. It was obvious, they said, why such a simpleton was living in poverty. In his neighborhood, there were a number of skilled craftsmen specializing in mulberry joinery and bamboo weaving. Chisuke watched them at their work and taught himself how to make lacquered boxes for hair oil and bamboo flower baskets. His daughter was now 13 years old, and by entrusting his products to her and sending her out on to the main thoroughfares of Fuchu to sell them, he managed to make just enough to support himself from day to day. The filial conduct of this child was widely commented upon throughout the province. What is more, she was a rare beauty, so perfectly formed that people would stop in their tracks to stare at her. One day, a rich citizen of Edo, passing by on his way from the ice pilgrimage, was so impressed by his first glimpse of her that he went straight to her father and begged permission to make her his only son's bride. Chisuke and his wife, together, for the rest, together with the rest of their household, subsequently removed to Edo, and there, thanks to their luck in having such a beautiful daughter, they lived the rest of their lives in comfort. Good looks, they say, are earned in previous existences. 
When the people round about heard of Chisuke's success, they began to take the greatest care in bringing up their daughters. But for myself, though I know nothing about the courtesans in Abagawa Quarter, I have noticed no improvement. All were evidently predestined to be plain. With Chisuke's case in mind, one cannot help thinking that Ling Chao, the daughter of the Chinese hermit Pang, must have been an ill-favored girl. If she had been, if she had been a beauty, she would surely not have been left selling baskets so long. All right, so I gotta admit, I'm kind of confused about this story. It took a weird turn at the end there, where you get to be pretty if you were good in the last life. Um, a paper fortune torn to shreds. So that is the title of the story. And Chisuke is the son of the man that earned the money, and he wasted it all. And then instead of working really hard to earn the money back, he waited until people gave him some money, which he then spent at a temple. And after the temple, he made some boxes and baskets, which his daughter sold, and then his daughter married a rich guy, and it appears that, I guess, Chisuke and his wife kind of lived off the rich guy until they died. And uh, the author then says at the very end, When the people round about heard of Chisuke's success, they began to take the greatest care in bringing up their daughters. But for myself, though I know nothing about the courtesans in the Abegawa, Abegawa quarter, I have noticed no improvement. So the author is talking about bringing up his daughter, and he's saying, you know, taking care and bringing up his daughter is not making him a rich man. All were evidently predestined to be plain. With Chisuke's case in mind, one cannot help thinking that Ling Chao, the daughter of the Chinese hermit Peng, must have been an ill-favored girl. If she had been a beauty, she would surely not have been left selling baskets for so long. Well, I don't know who the hermit Pang is, but I guess he's just saying at the end that you can't bank on your daughter to, uh, to fix your life. You've got to fix it yourself. Anyway, that was the story. We have now reached the end of book three. Book four is next. Ooh, there we are, book four. Well, you can kind of see it. And, um, yeah, that's it. Have a fabulous evening for a second time.